put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Ted to move you. Thunder Buddies for life, for better or worse. It was my birthday last week, so I could consider this a slightly belated birthday present. Meh, I'm not going to be returning it. Tammy Lynn and Ted are having relationship problems, and Ted gets the idea to fix it by having a kid. And the... As you may remember from the first film, he's not exactly anatomically correct. And even if it were, even if he were, it might, you know, kind of be bestiality. But yeah, basically, he does not produce sperm. He needs sperm. Sperm can lead to children, and that's not all that's wrong with it. At first, he tries to, there, there are some donor kind of things going on, but that, you know, once that's dealt with, that's, that's, you know, you could have cut that and really all you would have lost was some joke material, but yeah, they then get to go for an adoption and Ted is not legally, you know, considered to be a person. He's property. And they figure that it will probably be easier to sue the government for civil rights than to, you know, build him into a corporation. And that's basically our plot. It's, you know, as you see in the trailers, they meet... Sam Jackson, the young female lawyer, Seyfried, and yeah, that's about it. The the three of them, you know, Ted, John, and Sam, who, yeah, you know, they, they study for a while, they, you know, there's some court scenes, and, you know, they... Yeah, that's that's about it. And yeah, that's that's our plot. And yeah, that's it's not much of one. But the first one really didn't have much either. And the, you know, when I saw the first trail for this, I was really excited. You know, the the prospect of a court battle, I personally love and just yeah, you know, an actual plot where the, the first one was essentially, I love the first one. The first one is essentially just these two best friends have to accept, you know, not not living together and not constantly being, you know, that they they kind of have to grow up a little bit. And yeah, you know, that's that's about it. And of course, there is the 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 sequely thing going on with bigger, you know, supposed to mean better. And the I, you know, yeah, in, in spite of the trailers getting me, you know, excited for it. You know, since it did premiere in the U.S. before here. I was, you know, I knew going in that it wouldn't be on the level of the first one. And, you know, full disclosure, I love the few seasons of American Dad that I've watched. I've hardly watched any Family Guy, but I hate what I've seen. And I, yeah, I tried to sort of kind of defend A Million Ways to Die in the West. Yeah, it's... 
if it was just cut down to the jokes that really worked, if, yeah, because there are jokes, jokes in there that work. Now, the, you know, with Mila Kunis's lorry gone, Marcus, of course, freed up to, you know, get with Seyfried, which is a slight reversal of Seyfried's role in Many Ways to Die in the West. And, you know, at first I, you know, thought it was the really dumb, obvious, typical sequel thing of, you know, let's ditch the, the love interest from the first one, so, you know, the, the, the James Bond thing, you know, so that, you know, the, the protagonist can charm a new leading lady, but, you know, apparently Mila is pregnant with the spawn of Ashton Kutcher, so ironically, even though she's not in this film, she is involved in the, you know, in having a child with someone stupid, obnoxious, inexplicably popular, and who refuses to grow up. Seyfried is a pretty decent Mila substitute. They both had to do the kind of straight man thing to, you know, the double act of Mark and Seth. And, yeah, you know, she's she has good comedic timing and, yeah, and the, the basic joke with her character, the running thing, is that she does not know any pop culture because she, you know, she focused all her smarts on, you know, college, so, yeah, and it's, it's an okay gag, and of course, you know, it's in contrast with Ted and John, who love, you know, pop culture, and, you know, of course, the three of them connect over pot. Now... It, it has already been pointed out that the humor is, you know, very mean-spirited, and yeah, there's, yeah, I, I'd have to agree, and that the, you know, that Sam and John together is a little forced, it's, yeah, they're, they're okay together, but yeah. And, you know, yeah, there, there are a lot of things that happen in the film that don't really progress the plot any. Now. You, you will pretty much see where the plot is going. And, yeah, it, it like with the first one, doesn't really surprise. But, yeah. The and it's um, it does slightly feel like they just you know every joke that they came up with they actually went with, and there are definitely times where this one just feels like they were making up as they were you know making up as they were along, as they go along, and. Yeah, you know, there, there are things that just don't feel like there's quite enough setup, or quite enough payoff, and yeah. Now. This brings back Donnie. I was really glad. I, you know, I didn't know how big a role he would have. He's, he's not necessarily like one of the main characters, but he has a substantial role to to play, and yeah, he's just as creepy and psycho as in the first one, and just like, I'm kind of glad that I didn't know how big a role he was going to have, because when you watch it, the first scene of his I'm glad that there's more than that one scene, but when that scene had ended, and it's a short scene, I was like, is that actually it for Donnie? Because 
I would like to see more, but that is a pretty... If that's all we get of Donnie, I, I still approve of that. But, yeah, he's... There are elements of the plot that haven't really been given away in the trailers. Let's just say Donnie does not want Ted to win the court, the case. Now, and Patrick Warburton returns, and yeah, he's... There's, there's a nod to a famous character of his, and, you know, Mike Dorn joins the cast, and sadly does not get to do that much, like, you know, really funny stuff, but he, you know, he's game, clearly, and they, they even, you know, they brought in Kira from Deep Space Nine, Nana Visitor, if that's how you pronounce it. And they don't really give her any funny stuff. I mean, you you know, she's recognizable, aged, of course, but they don't give her any jokes. And I don't know why, why even bring in someone so recognizable, if, you know, okay, so, you know, 20 years ago still. And John Carroll Lynch, I was really glad when I saw him in the cast. And it is, as I hoped, he is just as tense and just devious he is he is straight up face off you know in charge of Erewhon prison in this just really intense and scary and you know that's something you know sometimes forget about John dude can be scary he can be really scary and Liam Neeson is also in this you know so you know two people from the middle ways down in the ways as far as people who weren't in the first, you know, Rabisi was in the first as well. I really wish Liam Neeson had a bigger role. He has... He doesn't have a very substantial role, but he is fantastic in what he does. And and they they have this... Near the end of his scene, he says, I'm going to remember this. And... You know, and obviously the reply is, I really hope you, you know, I'd rather you didn't. And unfortunately, they didn't. They they don't bring it back. I really wish he had come back later in the film for some, but yeah. And it is a little bit sad he is so much funnier in this than he is in A Million Ways to Die in the West. Which again, he was not given particularly much material to be funny in A Million Ways to Die in the West. So, not really his fault. Now, um, Morgan Freeman is also in this. Not an awful lot, but he's quite good in, yeah. And as has been pointed out before, McFarlane is a great voice actor. Now, the acting in this is a bit hit and miss. And as has been pointed out, it definitely... It definitely overuses its cameos. It's is pretty ridiculous, really. And the characters haven't grown since the first one. And Mark is made dumber as well as kind of an a-hole. Where in the first one, you know, part of the fun was that he was this sweet, good-natured guy that was sometimes used by Ted, and that's why he didn't have any more friends and. Yeah, you know, and this, he and Ted are very similar in that, yeah. Now, and others have pointed out that it's, the movie plays out much like the first film, just with a different story, where, you know, you'd really want, you want them to do something different, you know. Now... This does not really have a douche character like Joel McHale in the first one, or Neil Patrick Harris in A Million Ways to Land the West. Now, 
Now, I tend to... I'm of the opinion that when someone makes a great movie or video game, I'd rather they move on to something else, maybe similar, but not make a sequel. However, after after Seth MacFarlane made the first movie, he made A Million Ways to Die in the West, and then he went on to make this movie. So I appreciate that I'm not always right in, in my logic in that one. Now, this does have the same three writers, including Seth, from the first one. There are there are almost no, no bits in the trailers that aren't in the film, nor did the trailers really give everything away. Like, there are parts where you, you know, yeah, you, you knew that that bit was coming, but yeah. And, and like in the first, there the parts that you think you saw in the trailer, there might still be you know, one or two things in there that that they didn't put in the trailer, even the red bands, and yeah, that keeps it fresh as well. Now, part of what I love about the first one is that in the middle of all this, you know, crass humor, it really had heart. And this one has a heart, but it's this strange mix where, yeah, the, the humor and the heart in this one really don't quite go along the, the, the way they did in the first one, and it is kind of, it's, it's a, Yeah, basically, you know, the one of them will take over the film for a little while, and then you wait until the other one, you know, wrestles back the, the steering wheel, and then it goes with that for a while. You know, it's... Uh, yeah, what, what's it called? Timeshare apartment where you know, one or the other, but, yeah. Now... Similar to the first humor, really targets everybody, you know, trying to offend people of every ethnicity, sexuality, gender, gender identity, abled or otherwise, you know, regardless of age, yeah, and yeah, you know, it is, the, the film does, it, it does depend on how much you like this kind of really politically incorrect and pot smoking and that kind of humor. The, the jokes, as others have noted, can get kind of repetitive, and yeah, you know, yeah, and, you know, in addition to the types I've just mentioned, there's also a lot of pranks. Now, Some have said this felt like a Disney film with swearing, and yeah, I can kind of see. Yeah, like I said, the the heart sometimes really takes over, and yeah, you know, the, as you see in the trailers, there is a sequence in which Sam, against better judgment, allows Ted the the wheels of the car for 20 minutes. Long story short, well, not that long of a story, but anyway, shorter, he crashes into a barn, 
you know, Sam's head pops up in frame and he says, you know what, that's 20 minutes, you take over. That's a pretty good metaphor for this film. And I suppose... I suppose in that in that metaphor, Ted is the heart, which is obviously ironic, or just you know coincidental. But the and some have said that this is too long. I agree that it 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 would be easy to cut it shorter, but. Some people are saying that this is, you know, two and a half hours. Maybe. It is It is possible that by some... I don't know, some, some circumstance that I can't in my current state quite deduce that the version that I watched is entirely different from the one that, say, U.S. audiences are getting. But I'm sorry, here... The, the, the lights come on when the credits start, and then everybody leaves the theater. I noted the exact times. That was an hour and 45 minutes after the movie started. There is, there is, people are calling this two hours, two and a half hours. Never mind. It's, yeah. Should it be shorter? Yes. There is, it would be easy to cut out some of the material that doesn't work. But is it basically you know, overall a, I, I didn't really feel like it dragged, and yeah, it's, you know, it's really whether or not you really like it, you'll feel like it's dragged. I, I can completely, if you don't find it funny, if there are significant parts of this where you don't laugh, Without a doubt, it's gonna feel. Excuse me, it's gonna feel long because it's not. It's not like super tight. It's there's not a lot of plot, so it's basically just, you know, like there's a section of a film where basically just they're going from what is it Boston? I think they start in Boston to New York. So it's basically a road trip with the three of them, and yeah, for a while, nothing happens because they're just on the road to there, and yeah, you know, that's just uh, that gives them some time to have a bunch of gags without the plot progressing, because before the plot can progress, they have to get from Boston to New York, and yeah, you know, they're they're things like that where the where it won't really happen but I, if you like the first one there's a pretty good chance you'll at least like this one as well and yeah it's uh, now I've heard that comedy sequels are bad. I haven't watched very many, but I mean, with comedy, it always is. What, what is that thing like? Death is easy, comedy is hard, something like that. Comedy really takes a, you know, th things really have to come together. They had, you know, these characters have to really work. These actors have to play well off each other, off the situation. And when that happens, and it really works, and then the same people have to try to do something new, they might either just try to do the same thing again, or, you know, they'll go in a different direction, and yeah, so, yeah, comedy sequels often turn out bad. <sighs> Yeah, this definitely isn't as good as the first one, but it's it's okay. It it's better than a million ways to die in the West. It's definitely better than that. But it does 
similar to in ways that in the West. It does have the feeling of just being a really long episode of one of McFarlane's shows, which get away with a lot because they're 23 minutes per episode, they're animated, and they're on TV, which means that, you know, you can flip channels and, uh, yeah. And this definitely, you know, there, there are parts in this where you can really, yeah, where, where you feel like, well, if, if this wasn't a full movie, if the, you know, if there wasn't already a plot that we had to get moving with, then, yeah, that would probably not have bothered me as much as it does, but, yeah. Now, the... It has been noted that this is... This doesn't really have the structure of a typical film with, you know, there are several climaxes and then calm down points after that, and yeah, like there, there are times in this where you really feel like, well, the movie's ending now, right? I mean, that's the end, and then it just, yeah, keeps moving, and it's, some of the plot, it feels like they're just kind of subplots that get a lot of time, and yeah, things are just kind of dropped without, you know, enough real resolution on it. You know, and it's... Um, re resolution can be funny, you know, it doesn't have to, you know, take the energy from the, the comedy and, you know, Resolutions can be quite funny as well. Now, some have said that this is basically pro gay marriage propaganda. I can see what they mean for sure. And some have said that the best jokes are in the trailers. Some of them, yes, but there are plenty of great jokes left that, you know, left out of the trailers. And there are jokes that don't work. I f I would say that if we say, you know, for every three jokes there are, there's one that just misses the mark. There's one that you feel like should be funny, but... <laughs> And there's a third which really cracks you up. And that's pretty consistent throughout. Sometimes there's a little bit more of one of those, but that's, you know, that's about it. And, yeah, I would say there's enough of that third one to really, you know, there's not that much good here other than the jokes themselves. But... The jokes themselves are sometimes great, but yeah, outside of that, it, the, yeah, there, there are definite problems. And, you know, this feels, it, it lacks restraint. Um, you know, it also, this, doesn't particularly have a bigger budget than the first one, but there is also that thing of, you know, big budget comedies often, you know, I think Film Brain downright calculated with, you know, the, the greater budget, the worst comedy. And yeah, you know, it's, it's this thing of more money, more problems, more effects, more sets, more production value, set pieces and such which don't necessarily lead to comedies. Comedy can really come from limitations with just, you know, just a, f a few elements or a few especially well, you know, well-planned sequences or such. But if everything's really 
out there and big, then it's not necessarily going to be as funny. And, you know, some say that there is too much of the material that doesn't work. And, yeah, I respectfully disagree. Now, some have said the pacing is bad. It's, it's definitely uneven. And, yeah, you know... Definitely jokes are reused and such. Someone pointed out that, you know, there's a lot of good that comes out of Ted reacting just with facial features, you know, non-verbally to stuff. And yeah, definitely. There are a lot of big names in this. And yeah, the... The dance intro, excuse me, it's, excuse me, yeah, I, I don't quite know, it's, it's long, and it's dancing, and it's a long sequence of dancing, and it, it wasn't funny, it, this movie's not like, many ways to die in the West, where there are entire scenes that are just not meant to be funny, there there are, you know, short bits that aren't, you know, hugely funny, but as a as a whole, you know, every scene is meant to be funny, but yeah, the the dance intro and there there are a few Actually, maybe it's just the one. There's there's at least one, like, montage where it's just, you know, it seems like it could have been fun or funny, but it's just, it's a decent enough montage, but it just doesn't, yeah, you know, for, for comedy montages, it's just, it's not that interesting now but yeah you know when this is funny it is hilarious and it's already been pointed out that like the, the way it's filmed and edited is just fine and you know similar to the first one the ending has you know a, a scary and emotional element to it. Now. Now. The this is fairly episodic, you know, more than yeah, not not classic film structure, but just you know, yeah, one situation and then another, and yeah, and and it is you know more of the same as you know from the first film, and you know as with the first one, the, the effects and integration are seamless and you know, you really do believe that this bear is actually, you know, there talking to people and yeah. And like, like in the first one, part of what makes some of the raunchy material work is sort of the reactions, you know, and the first one, yes, there is, you know, someone has evidently taken a crap on the floor, but it's not so much the, the it's not that that has happened or the immediate reveal that's particularly funny, 
it's when the you know when they have to deal with you know when Lori has to clean it up and John is like just completely trying to to get away and you know just the yeah their their you know yeah their their reaction to it more than what is happening itself and some of the time that is also the case here it's you know it's the reaction or lack of reaction or it's yeah you know it's the the little detail or yeah now a lot of the stuff that works the best is when they have a certain subject, a certain gag, and they just keep riffing on that, or it's a running gag, they're, I don't really want to give them away, but there are a couple of running gags in this that, you know, and, and those are the ones that really work, you know, and some of the times you see coming where, oh, this, you know, this is where the gags can show up again, and sometimes you didn't really see it coming, but, yeah, those those are some of the ones that work the best, and the really the random stuff and the throwaways. Yeah, some of them really hit, but a lot of them just don't really, you know. And this doesn't. The first one has several real standout moments, and yeah, without going into spoilers, you know, for people who watched the first one. The, the, the listing off of white trash names, you know, Ming, and I suppose, and Teddy Ruxpin, yeah, those, those are, you know, probably the, the biggest that, you know, things you really remember afterwards and, you know, real, real standouts. This one tries to have some, but it kind of tries to have the same ones and it just doesn't, like, there are a couple of scenes in this that are similar to the white trash naming and, yeah, they just they don't work quite as well. I think the... Yeah. Yeah, without giving away details, you know, part of this takes place at the New York Comic Con, and there is an actual fight at that. Yeah. And that definitely feels like it's trying to recreate one or two things from the first one, and it doesn't quite. But, nevertheless, these scenes were still really funny. I've reviewed other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.